have to deal with. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I think uh, it's my pleasure to invite. Uh, I won't say my teacher because he's almost everybody's teacher, uh, Dr. Singhal, and. Uh, because of the Guru Purnima, we thought that we'll begin this uh, with Dr. Singhal. Um, and uh, after that, we plan to have um, sort of uh, invite, meet the professor sessions regularly. There are so many senior uh, teachers, so we shall have these. So uh, over to you, Dr. Singhal. Sorry for the delay. No, no. Very good morning to everyone. I think, uh, firstly, I'd like to convey my good wishes and a speedy recovery to Nasli Chapuria I just done this morning. That is also a victim of the coronavirus. Kindly do convey my best wishes to him for a very, very speedy recovery. And actually, uh, you know, when uh, uh, Sudhir approached me, he said, this is the Guru Pirnima time. So I think I should also first pay respects uh, to my teacher from whom I learned neurology, Professor Naushir Wadia. So thank you very much indeed. So I think, uh, well, I think, uh, you know, you won't be hearing much of science, you know, those who are looking forward to learn. I think you are probably an encyclopedia by now, listening to all the webinars, you know, along the precision medicine and other things. But I think uh, this will be a very, very simple talk. So those who are really looking forward to very scientific talk, perhaps will be disappointed. Well, I began, uh, you may well ask me, you know, why I chose to be a doctor. And then why neurology? And then I'll take you, you know, what has been my life. I'm a small town man, born in Mount Abu with a population was only four and a half thousand. And in the Walter High School where I studied in perhaps a largely semi-English medium, you know, there were only about 12 or 14 people with dedicated teachers, of course. It was also very proximal to the Adam Memorial Hospital. So we could sometimes go along and uh, you know, see the patients who were there and give volunteer services. So there were only three choices in those days. Either you go into administrative service, become an engineer or take medical. So naturally my selection was medical. And after my pre-med at the Maharaja's College Jaipur, I had great difficulty in getting admission because I think they were only admitting people from the Bombay State Universities. But anyway, and only college that I knew about, which became my alum Bakery was Grant Medical College. I really fell in love with the institution and the surrounding that they had. People sitting near the old hostel, but they under the umbrellas and all the things that they had. A lot of fun during that time. So I think these are some of the pictures. And there's a picture on the right side of the anatomy hall. So at the GMC, I did my undergraduate studies in 51 to 56 and my postgraduate studies from 56 to 59. During the undergraduate uh, physiology, pharmacology, I don't think they were very inspiring teachers, but during the postgraduate, of course, we had great guidance. And of course, they were got a uh, lot of comradeship. And the question was how we would learn. But of course, we learned from the teachers, we learned from our colleagues and friends, we learned from the students, and we learned from the patients on the wards. Books really, I mean, you see the books on the right side, they're all big volumes, Grey Anatomy and the others, you know, they really frightened me. But anyway, I think you know, the thing was to, you know, go along to the wards, along with the, you know, two or three friends of mine, discuss the cases. And that's how continue to make some cards, you know, the important thing that may be asked in the exam. So I think uh, this was, of course, what William Oster had also said that the important thing is to go to the wards and learn about the patients. And the patients often, if you listen to them carefully, are telling you the diagnosis. That has been very, very true. So there were much to learn from Dr. Wadia, my guru. It's not only in neurology, but you know how we kept the time, how he was available at all times in the evenings, even though they were honored, you know, I think he would come down whenever required. And he organized a couple of very, very good things which even continue today. In the two years there were war rounds, you know, where interesting cases were discussed. 
in the Wednesday he organized postgraduate clinics where even the students from the KM Hospital, Nair Hospital, Sion Hospital came along. And then we were having at that time once a month rotating meetings in the neuroscience at different institutions, be it KEM, Science Hospital, Nair Hospital. So I think it was a very, very good learning experience from this interaction of the neurosurgeons and neurologists. There were others, you know, Dr. Eddie Barucha, Dr. Anil Desai, and Dr. Dalal in particular. He was really a genius. And I wish he had continued in academics to win some awards for India. And of course, uh, there were the teachers, you know, Dr. Darab Dastur, always very incisive, very good neuropathology, always, you know, keen to see the patients and describe. We had very, very interesting brain cutting sessions. And of course, Dr. Uzani, the pediatrician, where I did about six months post. And therefore, there, you know, I think I found him to be very, very stimulating, very, very inspiring. And I think uh, he really used to spend, despite being an already till about uh, four o'clock in the afternoon, many of us had to hang around too, you know, while he was doing it. And then, of course, uh, the question was of gaining some experience in further training in neurology. And the people who really helped me, my doctor, cardiologist, Dr. J.S. Moose, who in fact handed, handed me, helped me with the fundraising as well. And Professor Wadia, who gave me introductory letters for his teachers in London to help me get the jobs. And indeed, in England, there was a great uh, learning experience. I didn't enjoy my seven days when I was out of work. But otherwise, you know, I started work even at the Brook General Hospital, which was neurosurgery. And I told the neurosurgeons who engaged me that, look, please don't ask me to wear the gloves or mask and go to the theater. And they didn't mind that. You know, they liked somebody to work on the wards and write the notes. And then, of course, uh, did the exams, had very good comrades and colleagues. Along with the Ceylonese friend of mine, we used to go along to different hospitals. Again, continue the same, learning from the patient. And the evening in the pub, uh, Dr. Kailash Bhatia told you, I think you go along and also discuss cases with your students. Working at the Medavale Hospital, affiliated the Institute of Neurology, was indeed a great experience for me. There are certain things that I learned. And one of them was that, you know, there was a patient who was presented at the Brook General Hospital by the neurologist who had a stroke, computer stroke on the right side. At the JJ Hospital, you know, when I was there, I think we tried to do the angiogram and demonstrate the block of the internal carotid artery. But when I suggested that why not we do an angiogram, they say, what for? What are you going to achieve? Artery is blocked or not blocked, but he's already got a complete aphasia and stroke. So I think the important, uh, they said, it is the quality of life that matters. And you don't want to really, you know, you know do investigations quite unnecessarily. Sometimes, you know, I would, uh, if the question was, you know, if some case was there and I would ask a question and say that, look, you know, you have written in the book, they were authors, which they would ask me and say, did I? Really? So I think uh, the question is the thoughts keep changing. And very important, I think, uh, in geography and PhDs were there at that time. So there would be weekly sessions where the neurosurgeons and neuroradiologists and us will meet. And indeed, the neuroradiologists learn from the neurosurgeons because patients that they had operated, they'll come back and look again. So I think there was a great learning experience as to how you keep learning all the time. When I came back, uh, there were, of course, uh, you, know, the, uh, you know, the Neurological Society of India had been formed already in 1951. And uh, the Professor Baldev Singh, a great, uh, you know, I think uh, he also, you know, was, uh, you know, quite in depth in the EEG and electrophysiology, particularly the EEG and, you know, the psychiatric issues as well, cognitives. And Jacob Shandy, a famous neurosurgeon, and Dr. Nasimam, physician at the, at the Chennai Institute. And there were others, you know, Dr. Ginde, who meticulously wrote the notes after the surgery. Dr. Ramamurthy, who really, you know, was a doyen in South, you know, Institute of Neurology at uh, Chennai. And he was not only a neurosurgeon, he was a good neurologist as well. Professor Ghosh in Kolkata, Dr. Baruchar of Awadi, and of course, Dr. Tandon, 
at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. So in 1962, when I returned, I joined the JJ Group of Hospitals and the Bombay Hospitals. So I was already at the JJ, but at the same time did my consulting at Bombay Hospital. There were certain advantages. At JJ Hospital, there was a lot of academic, there were chronic neurology, where you learn real neurology, examination, clinical findings, unusual cases. And there was, of course, a service oriented where you had to deliver on the acute neurology and common neurology. And of course, uh, you know, I took an advantage that I got the brilliant students of JJ to solve problematic cases of mine at Bombay Hospital. So I would request Sudhir Kothari that please come along, you know, I think this case, you know, can you solve this? So, you know, we found out that this was the cause of seizure with hypocalcemia. Or I'll request Dr. Rup Bursani to come along and do something for me. So I think it was really very, very, very interesting. And of course, uh, some of the students from the other universities came along and uh, we learned from them as well. And Dr. Meshram from PGI came along. And I was really hoping that Dr. Meshram would get the reader's post at the JJ Hospital. And we will have a great department of the JJ Hospital. But unfortunately, you know, I think the, the, the bureaucracy, you know, was not uh, willing to give him beyond lecturership. And naturally, you know, having spent good time and got good DM, he went away to, uh, to Nagpur. Of course, he had done very well. And I think he is excellent uh, in World Federation of Neurology. But this was a great loss, I think, to the Grand Medical College and JJ Hospital. At the JJ Hospital, because as you know, during the time of Dr. Wadia, neurology was growing. Also, not London and Europe as well, but America, it was just uh, beginning to grow. And I think we used to get a lot of observers from UK and USA who knew Dr. Wadia, who were trained by Lord Brain, and they will spend some time. And they were world rounds, which are very, very interesting with the inputs from these people. So we really continue to learn on the world rounds of the JJ Hospital. And there you are, my teacher, Dr. Wadia, myself, and of course, Sarosh, you know, who really did wonders subsequently as a teacher, also a speaker, and I think he really, so it was a great thing, and it was very kind of him, for him to send this picture with me. And here, of course, you will see many, many people. You know, I think, uh, you know, you will see Dr. Jimmy Lalkaka on the right side, over here, and you will see Dr. Kumar, and of course, you will see, you know, this doctor from Goa who went away. I don't know where he is. She is just stuck. Actually, she knew us, Dr. Mohit Bhatt, Dr. Desai, who did a lot of work for Dr. Wadia. Group, of course. Bahati, who is no more unfortunately. Nathan, the lady who worked with Dr. Wadia just got and went away to America and Muscle. Satish is over here. And Charu is over here. And of course, he has gone away to Kolapur. So I think uh, we have a legacy of many people doing wonderful work. Kailash Bhatia is not seen in this. Of course, uh, as you know, we are very, very proud of him. It is such wonders and really, I mean, to occupy the chair and does such good work at the you know, University College or Institute of Neurology is really very, very pleasing. And of course, Mohit is doing tremendously good work at the Kokela Band with wonderful radius and his work on Wilson's disease is now international. On the front seat, you will see Dr. Amroliwala. He really joined the Air Force as a medical doctor in Britain. Sarosh is here, and then Nita Mehta, Mr. Wadia, and Kishore Shetty, who went away to Mangalore, and I think uh, Manipal. And he really did a lot of good neurology over there. I think uh, one good thing uh, that happens in England is that you make good friends, uh, Dr. Wadia had. And uh, I had this Dr. Edmund Kishley. He was the nephew of McDonald Kishley. And he really became a good friend of mine. The important thing was that he was at Preston and he told me that any number of students that I send, he will really make them as residents in his hospital and they can move on. And many of them wanted to work with me only to get to Preston, you know, under Dr. Edmund Kishley to move on to wherever they wish to go. Charu Sankla worked there and went away, of course, to, you know, to specialization in movement disorder. Anand Virjinkar stayed at Oxford and now he's doing clinical electrophysiology. Suresh Bhatt, I believe, has come back and he's at Bangalore. 
Ganesh Naik, I don't know where he is now. Dr. Rao was not my student, but he was my man to get into uh, at Preston. I don't know where he is now. I've lost touch with him. There are many conferences being held, and I think uh, it was important that we attended most of them. Neurological Society of India, Indian Academy of Neurology, World Federation of Neurology, Asian and Ocean Academy of Neurology, MDS. So I think we continue to attend many of the conferences, and these are very learning experiences. The important thing is you don't learn only recent advances, but also make good friends over there. And I think uh, the whole important thing was the 14 World Conference of Neurology in 1989. You know, we had uh, Dr. Rup Gursani in our team, also Dr. You know, Nirmal Surya were there, Jimmy Lal Kaka were there, Satish were there. And believe me, you know, I think a uh, maximum number of uh, posters were put up by all work done by Rup Gursani. He wrote the abstracts for each one of us. So I think I must thank uh, Roop at this juncture. And this conference was, I think, uh, very well organized by Dr. Jagjit Chopra. And as you know, this uh, brought a lot of uh, international people. And I think uh, it gave a big, big push to neurology in India. Well, I think in the late 50s to 70s, uh, before the technological advances, one had to rely basically on clinical teaching which I think are even relevant even today. Well, the learning points were history and art of interrogation. Very, very, very important. I think 80 to 90%, you can solve the problem by interrogation alone. The three fundamental questions which you all do, and this begins before even the, when the patient is entering your clinic, his foot steps start telling you, the way he's walking is telling you, and when he sits down, and then when you are asking questions, you want to think which system is involved, where is the lesion, and then is the getting, things are getting worse or getting better or static to determine the pathology, and then you start thinking about the etiology. And I can assure you that many a times it is the history that matters. And please do not depend on your clinical assistants to take the history, because this is where you make an eye contact with your patient and the patient knows you and you know the patient and you know the diagnosis also. I wouldn't mind the clinical findings of the clinical assistant, but I would like to take the history myself. And this uh, is of course the being a shy Sherlock Holmes. You listen to the patient without interrupting him. Make an eye contact, let him narrate all the complaints that he has. And often it is the friend who wants to talk first or the relative will shut them up they want you to see the new MRI pictures first, please put them aside and let the patient only narrate the symptom without any leading question. That's the way I proceed. Art of observation, art of communication, and actually I never contradict the patient or the caregiver. Whatever they say has a meaning. And ultimately, you've got to decide how much the weight to give it. Physical examination, again, you know, I think I usually like if a person is complaining of weakness in the legs, I like to begin with the legs and not from head to toe. So examining the concern part is uh, what I believe to spend most of the time on. And my investigation will be relevant. They should be interpreted in the light of clinical relevance. And there are major laboratory changes in India in recent years, and I think a lot more that you can do today than we could not do earlier. But I think uh, ordering an investigation which is not required can mislead you into a different and a wrong path. So before the imaging area, the question was to be Hamlet or not, to be or not to be. If a person is complaining of headache of a short duration, should I do the lumbar puncture? Should I not do the lumbar puncture? If a person has to have should I do the angiogram? Should I do the PEG? I think these are all questions, you know, which uh, really made uh, uh, neurology very, very challenging and interesting. We had to use the conventional imaging techniques. Pneumoencephalography, I was not very good at it, Dr. Bhagwati was, but I was good at angiography. And the monography we used to use contrast material, and of course the air study, as I said. The lumbar puncture, you know, I think I spend more time in positioning the patient and doing the lumbar puncture. 
and uh, carotid angiography, we were doing in a really, really crude manner, puncturing the artery. But fortunately, no patient came to any harm. I don't know. I think we didn't dislodge any plaque. We didn't dislodge any of the plaque. And uh, this is one of the pictures of the angiogram where you see the in the tuberculous meningitis. And as a physician, you know, I think you've got to provide treatment which is effective, safe, and also not very costly. I think there's no point in having a long prescription with several unnecessary medications. It should be rational medicine, and we must tell them the risks first and the benefits later. And I think uh, it is very, very important to spend some time in explaining the treatment. And mind you, in the day that we were, now of course you have very, very good remedies. But when I was and Dr. Warrior were practicing, we could make a diagnosis. But from the treatment point of view, we didn't have much to offer. But there was something we could do. We always gave them hope, some optimism, and also some empathy. I think even today, I thought I think I should be winding up my practice, but still I get patients basically. I spend time with them, even if they have motor neuron disease. Give them some hope and, of course, some treatment. And also spend some time as to how to lead a life from now on. There are several rewards one gets, you know. You know, I was called to see a patient at Dongri who had been operated for the lumbar disc, but unfortunately developed a hematoma and was left with particularly sphincter disturbance. And when I went there, in those days, uh, we didn't have this sophisticated thing. We had a tube, uh, police tube, with a little cannula kept uh, downstairs tin, you know, so urine could keep collecting there. It was really, and the fellow had not moved out of the house for nearly three to four months. All I did was suggest that, you know, why not uh, see a, neuro a neurologist, and I referred to Dr. Ajit Parke. He really taught him intermittent catheterization and you know, the person could really go around and meet socially people. On Diwali day, he brought a box of sweets. What did I do? Nothing, just guided the patient. Didn't have any treatment for him. And of course, the important tool that we had in those days was neurosurgery. And of course, uh, all these neurosurgeons that you see, Dr. Ginde, Dr. Homi Dostu, Bhagwati, Tejan Singh, I think uh, when I would see a patient, uh, say somewhere, and Dr. Sariya was our teacher in gynecology, he would say that, you know, what treatment do you have to offer? You only have phenobarbitone and Daventin. So it was. So I say, apart from infections and two anti epileptic drugs, you didn't have much to offer. But, uh, you know, Dr. Bhagwati was, of course, uh, you know, I think uh, always wanting to do something and he even did try to you know, make the Excel frame with his uh, brother, who was an engineer, and did the stereotactic surgery using pneumoencephalography. All that disappeared in 1970s when the levodopa came along. By that time, we had done 100. I don't know how many we harmed, but many did improve. There were lesions, lesion activity. There were no stereotactic uh, deep brain stimulation. So in 1960 to 80s, uh, journey as a neurologist it was basically caring, teaching, learning, some focus on few diseases. The most important thing was we had Miss Barker at the JJ Hospital keeping meticulous notes. And also we had very good records, uh, you know, which Dr. Wadia made us, uh, you know, keep. And these records really helped us considerably. We kept the record of the persons in my own clinic, kept the record of the persons with myasthenia gravis. Today, of course, we have their addresses and telephone numbers, but previously there was nothing. If the address was, you know, it is uh, behind this uh, Gulcha market, you know, in that particular lane, you know, it was impossible to find that. And there was no telephone which was there. So we lost uh, a lot of records. But today, of course, I think you have a chance to, practically everybody has a cell phone and you can write down, keep their addresses. So I think uh, there's a great uh, improvement in that direction. So we couldn't write any particular follow-up on these patients. There were also cases where Dr. Nibisha had started the first thymectomy, at least in the Bombay region. And we had several cases of thymomas. And unfortunately, the records were lost. And the only thing we could do 
was to write down the, you know, sort of some sort of demographic data and the clinical presentation using the new classification mind. Wasserman is no longer applicable and you must use the Myasthenia Gravis Foundation of America. And of course, uh, we had many patients presenting with only, uh, you know, eye symptoms and some more advanced cases. And some of them, of course, even on the respirator, a few of them. Again, uh, like elsewhere, you know, we found that uh, in the mares, uh, it is the sixth and seventh decade when the peak rises. In the earlier 20s and 30s, it is the females. And of course, the acetylcholine -like receptor antibody were positive in about 84 to 85 percent. There was some, you know, interest developed in multiple sclerosis uh, because previously it was considered to be non-existent. I was Dr. Wadia's registrar, and we were going to a Parsivar where a patient was admitted with paraparesis. We didn't have any MRI. Dr. Wadia asked him one question. Did you have a similar episode in the past? And he said, yes, and he recovered. So I think obviously the diagnosis of a recurrent episode was demyelination and uh, multiple sclerosis was a possible diagnosis. It was in that time considered to be a disease of the West Physician didn't believe, but I think uh, then the Shoemaker criteria came in 1965. And therefore, we collected the cases and wrote up the article, which was the second article after the Matthews article from the law, using the criteria. We also had two patients who died, and Dr. Dastu did the pathology in them and described the area of the demyelination. The important thing was that uh, at that time, uh, Professor Kurova in Japan was actually very keen to study the Asian type of multiple sclerosis. He organized two conferences in Tokyo and one in Kyoto. In Tokyo, he invited Dr. Dalab Dastu, but finding that it will be clinical, he, he asked me to go along. And I spent some time from the ward uh, notes at the JJ Hospital CAP. I spent some afternoons to collect the data and attended these workshops. And one of them was that uh, our Asian MS differed from that in the West. That was, of course, the pre MRI days. And we call it optical spinal MS. Wrote some articles along with them. But now, of course, we have the MRI and we have the McDonald's criteria, which you all use. We disseminated our lesions in the classical sites, juxta, periventricular, infra, and spinal cord and also dissemination in time. And the McDonald's criteria have been revised and will be further revised. Looking for the mimics at that time, there was a book by McElpine on multiple sclerosis, where each disease was described to be a variant of multiple sclerosis. And we also had the ease, I mean, we also had the Devix disease. So, you know, looking at that, you know, we had uh, this uh, patient, you know, presenting with visual disturbance, but that was not due to demyelination, but the hemorrhages. And we also had uh, about 28 patients uh, who also had subacute severe myelopathy. And although it has superficial resemblance to MS, but it was totally distinct. And I think we wrote pathology. And uh, there were about eight cases described earlier. And we wrote these cases up. And I think it's about time, I think some good residents should really pick up more of these cases and describe because recently, we had presented the case, and that was presented in the neuro update meeting. And Jose Villa suggested that why not give immunological treatment to these people because very likely the vasculitis. And I have a patient with hemorrhages and ischemic lesions, and I think he's doing very well with cyclophosphamide. And by that time, I think, as you know, I think he was there. I don't know who were present last evening, but a really, really remarkable talk uh, by. Uh, Dr. Sinan Pitok, who is an authority. The Mayo Clinic, as you know, is the epicenter of Mecca for neuroimmunology. And this was here that Lennon had described the aquaporin-4 antibody. And the amount of antibody that they described and told about yesterday and the movement disorders really was amazing. And I think uh, this is the way that I think things are going. And I think uh, Nimhans is probably doing some of this. And I think we have to take advantage of them. I'll give you one uh, case, I think, uh, where you know the spectrum disorders came into existence. 
a patient who had hiccups and vomiting, and of course, uh, had uh, two to three weeks of workup by the gastroenterologist. Only a few weeks later, the patient developed cervical myelopathy. And this, of course, was a case of neuromyelitis spectrum disorder. There's a great value in keeping the records. I hope uh, now you all must be keeping because things have become much easier with the system. But when I was uh, working, a patient came along from the law who had a large head and difficulty in walking. And they had attempted the ventric tap, which actually was a failure. And therefore, you know, CT MRI not available, but I started keeping the record of these patients. And then when the CT scan became available, we found that they had a lot of white matter changes and cysts, which you can see also on the MRI picture. So these were the cases of leukodystrophy, which is now popularly known as Vendor Knapp disease. And this is, of course, the autosomal recessive. There are many more cases in the Agarwal community. And you see the large head in these pictures. And we wrote up the Rup Bursani, Rajesh Udani, and Avanti Biniwale in the Pediatric Journal of Neurology. And we also had the, the gene tested, which kind of couldn't do in India. We took Sukhubai and Naidu's help and Garospe. So I think we wrote up this, uh, found the, they had the founder effect. And the reason I think you have also found in this scar, spinal cerebral degeneration, and also some muscle diseases which Dr. Satish Kadilkar has described. And I think the reason is that, you know, although there's been a lot of intermarriages in the Agarwal community, and a goel will not marry another goel, but they forget that his wife may be Mittal, and another person's wife may be Mittal, so that there could be a bit of consanguinity in that direction. But fortunately now, I think there are a lot of intermarriages. Uh, people of the world community are marrying non Agarwals, which I think will have some effect in eradicating these diseases. For instance, my son, who is a stroke specialist, has married a Sindhi girl, and we are very proud. And my daughter has married a Gujarati. So they are both non Agarwals. So at least uh, we are safe from the point of view of against a very dystrophy, scar, or muscle disease. And this is when the Professor Vendekanap. I think I admire her for all the work that she's doing. I visited her department. She really is a very, very intensive person. There's an excellent book on, uh, you know, on the MRI studies. She had described new diseases, and she was doing extensive work in the field of megencephalic dystrophy. And the disease very aptly deserves her name. There was a bit of a Sakubai's uh, contention with her that uh, our cases were diagnosed about the same time, but they were rejected because we didn't have the facilities for doing any of the metabolic tests for Kedawan disease and other diseases. But of course, we haven't, we haven't still done anything further and she had done really remarkable work. And I really admire her. For the diagnosis, besides conventional approach, sometimes you, know, you, have got to, you, know, you have got to take some social history and behavior of the patient. And uh, I think uh, the Siddharth Mukherjee, the author of the book, you know, has also written a book on laws of medicine, where he says the strong intuition is much more powerful than the weak test. I think I'll take a few minutes uh, before I wind up. There was the author of The Emperor of the Melodies. He mentioned about the 50-year-old respected individual from Brooklyn Street in London. As you know, Brooklyn is uh, where near the, the Mass General Hospital, but I say where all the rich people who street, st stay, including one, one of the potential candidates who lost uh, for the presidential election, was having an unexplained weight loss. They did the works, everything, including the pad CD, and they didn't find anything at all. In the MGH lobby, where there's a good aroma of the coffee, he found this gentleman talking to a person who looked like a drug peddler. And the penny dropped. And he found that, of course, HIV, which they were not doing routinely unless it is the permission, and the patient rarely had HIV. So I think sometimes observing these people outside the, the clinic also is helpful. I'll tell you all the story of a you know, family physician, a doctor, who took the son you know, immediately because he complained of blurring of the vision in the right eye. And the right eye, the dilated fixed pupil, no direct or consensual light reflex, vision was blurred. 
he sent to the neurologist. And the neurologist naturally wanted to extrude the third nerve lesion. And of course, there were no ptosis or no eye movement defect, but still, he said they must urgently do the MRI, MRI, CSF to look for the subarachnoid illness, virus illness, virus illness serious jargon. The mother came along. She was panicking. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, I thought, why not spend some time on find out? So I said, when did this happen? And what was he doing at that time? So the boy said he was playing cricket. So I said, you're batting, bowling? He said, no, you were fielding far out. And I said, uh, were there any plants or trees around? So I thought that there might have been a datura leaf around and he might have, you know, rubbed the finger. And that's why he might have got it because there was no history of any drops being put in. And the next day, mother brought the datura. I had never seen the plant before. And now the flower. So brought it along and this is what had happened. So a complete relief all around. I do not know how many mistakes I might have made, but I'll tell you about one of them. A Bori lady, 40 years, came with weakness with some fully ability. And she had also reported some improvement because the EMG reported decrement and we gave some, you know, it's like receptor inhibitors. And I thought this might be myasthenia gravis. But as you know, we don't strip the patients. And also in the EMG, what they had done, not done, was EMG needle. It was done by a junior person. And that not stripped her, and the needle examination was not done. Actually, this was more than your own disease. I really, really regret it. But not that one could have done anything, even if the diagnosis was made. But there must be many mistakes I may have committed, where the diagnosis may have really change the life of the person. Well, you know, sometimes the peri or the diagnosis made much later. There was an industrialist from Kolkata, no diabetes, blood pressure, took an evening flight from Kolkata to Mumbai. At Mumbai airport, you know, waiting for the luggage to arrive, he became drowsy and responsive. He was rushed to the Hindu hospital, had the works, you know, blood examination. You know, I think everything was done in a very hurried manner, EEG. Angiogram, CSF, observed for two days and discharged, di no diagnosis. Perhaps he might have had a seizure. It might have been a brainstem ischemic episode, who knows? But it was a few weeks later, a news item appeared in the Times of India that there was a modus operandi of a person who was checking the list of passengers in the business class. And when the person went to have a, you know, order tea and went to the washroom, who put a sedative in the tea and would also take away some part of his luggage. So I think this was the, how the diagnosis was made. The thing which we had not done, I was also called to see the patient, didn't think of this at that time. But on occasions, you know, when tests are negative, but your suspicion is high. This is Dr. Jimmy Lal Kaka's case. A middle-aged Gujarati lady, she was sent here because she had profound weakness and she was on a ventilator. And uh, also in the last tube. Everything was negative. Even the EMG was inconclusive. Everything was negative. But naturally, you know, Jimmy Lalkaya suspected that this was probably myasthenia and improved with steroids and rituximab. She's completely well now. But we thought, why not we send the test to a better laboratory? And you find there that they, we were doing RIA or ELISA, but they did the cell based and they found it to be must cluster positive. And then, of course, discovering newer and newer antibodies. Uh, so I would suggest that you have a case where the diagnosis is not made, and we do not have all the facilities, perhaps, to take the help of you know, Oxford or Bayo Clinic. And I think we are using the euroimmunoassays. You know, some of these commercial products are not really very reliable. But now, I think you are very, very fortunate in the digital era. Clinical CT scan 74, MRI in 80s, cell phone use in 83, optical mouse 98, Google in 98. When, you know, we ordered the, you know, uh, the, our first, uh, uh, you know, the, the, at, at the clinic, you know, the desktop, Dr. Rub Busani was with me, and we were struggling with all that thing, you know, till the mouse came along and thing became easier. Now, of course, you've got the watch, Apple Watch, iOS, Android applications, I think what not. I'm very poor at that, we're still struggling. So that you can make the diagnosis of MRMS, 
You can make the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease using Toilet scan. And you, of course, have got electronic uh, medical records. You've got the Google, uh, they good for internet. And also PubMed, you know, for, otherwise we couldn't write an article because we didn't have enough references. And of course, you got the telemedicine. And you can talk to anybody in the world today. So therefore, you're moving towards precision medicine, genetics, exome sequencing, autoimmune diseases, and yet much more to come. I think uh, Dr. Jimmy Laka had told you all about the future, you know, about the gene sequencing, gene replacement. Well, you know, I think really forget in the neurology update. As a neurologist, uh, treating patient was satisfying, but I was still not very happy experiencing the suffering and, you know, what did we do for Parkinson's disease? We gave drug and still they were not happy. Something more had to be done. And with the help of colleagues, you know, like Dr. Viraj Sanghi, Jimmy Lalkaka, Khushnuma Mansukhani. So we decided that we should really do something about this. So we started the Neurology Foundation, Vidya Upcha, for which we have been doing the neurology updates since 1998. And largely, you know, to credit of Dr. Viraj Sanghi, he really takes in very good interest and really produces a remarkable meeting. And of course, we have the Parkinson's Disease Movement Disorder Society. And this is the picture. You know, I think all the ladies, you know, I think Jimmy is the attraction for them. And they are doing a great work. And you see Dr. Maria Barreto, who really is the person who is doing everything in the Parkinson's Disease Society. And this is where Dr. Kaspal is our chairman. Dr. Sarosh Katrak was our chairman for some time and helped us quite a bit. And now we have Dr. Kalpal who is helping us. And indeed, uh, I think uh, we are, are very pleased that there are now multidisciplinary intervention, speed therapy, occupation. Patients come and tell us that it is really making a difference in life. Medicines are helping, DABs are helping if required. But of course, this thing is helping them considerably. And now we have 64 support centers in 13 states in India. Really, I'm proud of it. Also in Sikkim, you know, far away place where even the access to the people is difficult, but the people are really very good, very hospitable. So I'd like to now, I think, uh, take enough of your time to take home some messages. Please, even though you have all the technological advances, the emphasis should be on clinical approach. Use investigative tools discriminately. Treat the individual and not the disease. Must feel their suffering and empathy is important. For me, I've learned from my mistakes. I hope I don't repeat the mistakes. There's something to be learned from everyone in life. There's constant learning in life, even in the walk of life, even you know how the humility, the beggar is begging, or whatever it may be. You know, I think there's something to be learned. And you know, I don't mind being number two or even number ten or twelve or fifteen. You know, I don't want to be number one. There's nothing wrong with it. And experience, of course, is what you get. Somebody said that when you do not get what you wanted, at least you have gained something, and that's the experience. So thank you very much, sir. I have taken a lot of your time, and this has been my journey in the life. You know, I'm still active though, but I think I keep learning for all my students. You know, I think, you know, I think there are many of them: Sudhir Kothari, Rupa Sahani, Avanti Biniwale in Pune, of course, Bindu Maimon, and of course Nirmal Surya, Jimmy Lal Kaka, Vera Sanghi. Not my student though but this is my teacher anyway. So that's about it. You know, I think many, many people whom I can mention, but that will take quite some time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That uh, was, I mean, uh, I mean, you're sh really short of words. I don't know what to say. You have summarized your whole journey in uh, such a short time and all the points that you have taught us. I know there are so many of your students here who want to talk. I will ask one by one everybody to just uh, talk and ask questions and you know, oh, no, no 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 questions uh, I, I, I can't <laughs> I, all the uh, boys were asking about some you know some rare disease you know and some no i you know i glone i glone i really don't know what i glone you know. no, uh, uh, i mean just to break the ice the no, no, problem, sure, sure, sure. when i when i joined uh, neurology uh, it was so difficult. Dr. Singhal used to speak so softly. You had to go really close to him and listen what he's saying. Mm -hmm. And then he did not start at the basics. He started at his level. You had to come up to his level, whatever. 
so he will not go about teaching from dr singhal you have to learn from his persona from his being how he handles patients and the point about history so it is so important the friday meeting we used to prepare a case and we were in jj and we would uh, prepare all sorts of history and everything and then we would be all ready to present the case and dr singhal would say wait let me talk to the patient so just one minute he would ask the patient baba kya takleef hai and in that one minute with those that three points what he says he would have his diagnosis clear mm-hmm. and dr singhal tells us no. that he would give us the difficult cases i would as a uh, pg student i would go to uh, bombay hospital and he would give me okay these are the five sort of difficult cases to see and at the end of the day i would have you know fresh from all the dd this that whatever and I, i would write the diagnosis and i would think i have made a brilliant diagnosis and on dr singhal's paper he had already written that diagnosis no 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 i mean no, you no, never no. really had to no, no i called you to you know crack the diagnosis which i had missed you know <laughs> <laughs> okay fortunately that never happened anyway so i tell you when i was a houseman Uh, we had shown him a case and it was a motor neuron disease case and we had covered the patient from neck down so that he doesn't see the fasciculations in mm-hmm. wasting and we told sir you have to make the diagnosis but you can't see the patient only on the face and he made the correct diagnosis because of the spastic speech so that's that's where the, the uh, you remember charu the patient in the female ward in uh, jj there was one patient who was there for almost Three months. That patient was just not improving, and we uh, one to five of the single would come for the round, and so we took him for the round, and we were trying to gloss over. You know, that is a case of Parkinson, nothing. You know. So we all in that patient of Parkinson, so and we, then ah, uh, yeah, finish that. Then we'll ask everybody to go one by one. Yes, yes. Yeah. So that patient. while on the round the patient had a hoarse voice and dr singhal said no this is not parkinson see again and sure enough when we checked up it was msa so he would he is an error correction machine you know so <laughs> it, it will not pick up any <laughs> error he will pick up best way putting it error correction as the error correction machine is a fantastic term <laughs> yeah can i ask uh, um hello ha uh, yeah can i ask uh, uh, siddharth you have to unmute yourself come in first i i am uh, trying to you, get a... you have to unmute everybody yeah yeah who have is there uh, till... siddharth no. viswas anyway uh, has he yes yeah, there he is chalo yes. <coughs> good afternoon sir uh, all my colleagues and this is my pranam to dr singhal my guru and is the best teacher i have ever seen there is no doubt about his clinical thing and this thing is the best clinical person and the clinical diagnosis treatment patient empathy but one more thing beside the elephantine memory which he has he has got a, such a foresight that uh, which i realized today he sent me to calcutta about 35 years back and after in the initial years i was thinking that why did i come to calcutta i was struggling and i, I knew no one here in calcutta and um, jj and you would not see a single patient in the day i would not get a single patient that day and i would ask her, so why did i come to calcutta i could have stayed in bombay or nagpur but after such five years i may be poor than what i would have been in bombay i might have been more richer in bombay i am poor here but i am the most happiest person here in calcutta without any tension without any sorrow and very peaceful life and and doing a reasonably good work so he had that foresight that this boy who is from bengal should go back to bengal and he would be happy in the long run not in the short term so that foresight which he had is remarkable and my pranam to him again thank you thank you biswas biswas except dr surya all of us are poor <laughs> <laughs> anyway can i request uh, chandrashekhar to come in next yeah yeah uh, 
Hello. Uh, you know, but when he challenged uh, Frank Yatsu, who was a stroke specialist, uh, and Frank Yatsu showed him the paper, and he he really laid the red carpet for all of us to go there in case they visit the department. He also wrote some articles there. Go ahead, Chandrasekhar. <laughs> thank, thank you, sir, uh, for your. Uh, you know whatever i am and what i learned uh, uh, from you is because uh, you know i would say that uh, whatever i am today is because of what i learned from you because uh, getting in sometime back before his talk i messaged the uh, professor singel and said that said that i am uh, looking forward to listening to you he said don't waste time i am just <laughs> going to tell the tale there is no science because <laughs> i i said that uh, i think listening to the tales in life and the lessons in life is more important that you learn from these tales and uh, dr singer is a perfect role model for everyone uh, in life as a person as a practitioner and uh, i think while on ways from while i was working with him from bombay hospital i used to travel with him daily Uh, whenever he used to go on rounds in the taxi going back with him to bomb, uh, to jj hospital yeah, coming back us. even i, I yeah. even i was in the taxi <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then he used to drop me uh, uh, my residence on his way back to home so uh, during those times in the taxi and uh, talking like i learned so many things uh, not only during the neurology but uh, as a person in life i think uh, uh, that is what the great things i was when i came out of pgi i was academically as a person very arrogant but then when i observed dr singhal i am totally changed and what i am today is because of that i think i was also in the taxi many times <laughs> <laughs> and i in fact i would tell you that he gave me his own flat to stay post dm for one year I didn't have any place to stay in Can Bombay. He was just like a godfather to me. I think he is godfather to everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Can I ask Subhash uh, to come in that, next? That bit about learning from everybody is really there. You know, I, one small thing I want to just tell because I, it just came up that when I came to Bombay, Bombay, I had just passed my MD and you know I was fresh with all knowledge of immunology and genetics. so he one day he told me okay tell me about genetics something so i you know while he was having his lunch which consisted of one small bottle of milk or something so while he was having that i gave him a little 10 15 minutes talk on uh, genetics and then about two months later or three months later we were somewhere on the round and uh, some point came up and he said this is this so i said how do you know that sir he said you only told me so i had forgotten and he remembered i think that is that is usual story of all of us yeah <laughs> <laughs> and in a request to you he would come sudhir he is like a sponge he absorbs everything yeah we are you know like like uh, leaky bottles you know yeah <laughs> <laughs> subhash can i request subhash to come on na uh, roop you are asking me yes yeah <laughs> Okay, I thought it was only for the people who had done DM under Doctor Singhal. No, no, uh, no, no. no. Learn from but, him. But having said that, uh, having said that, I think Doctor Singhal is at a stage where he is everybody's teacher. I mean, now it's no longer important whether you have done a formal DM under him or not. He is everybody's teacher. And I, there's one experience which I have to shared with Doctor Singhal also, and he will probably remember that we were watching a, we were watching a play by Anupam Kher. in hyderabad anupam kher had a autobiographical play and he said that while he was shooting for yash chopra's film uh, suddenly yash chopra told him are tumhare tumhe paralysis ho gaya tumhe paralysis ho gaya tumhara muh teda ho gaya tum daud ke singhal ke paas jao this is part of the play daud ke singhal ke paas jao i was very impressed because i am a bollywood fan and i met dr singhal i said i heard your name in the play uh, the the lines are that singhal ke paas jao and dr singhal told me a huge story about the whole episode and he said yes he had treated b r chopra years ago and that is how he had told uh, yes chopra and he was so that is dr singhal who go beyond you know he has become part of the national consciousness so thank you dr singhal that's all i would thank you so much thank you ashok ashok yeah. Yeah. yeah there you are go ahead oh, oh. 
I've had arg- arguments with juniors who have told me that Dr. Singhal is not a typical expressive teacher. He does not give thundering lectures on the town. But then it took me time to make them understand that if you want to learn from Dr. Singhal, oh, keep, your, keep your mouth shut and watch him in action. And that's and- an amazing way to learn a hell of a lot of neurology case by case from him. I hope many of you now will agree with me. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> uh, one small thing, uh, when a person came in walking and the person had come with a history that my right leg is feeling heavy. So I was, we were examining the patient and then we said, uh, the Dr. Singer said, don't even look at the right leg. Don't check the right plantar, check the left one. If the left leg is dragging, left plant is up going, look at the cord. If the left leg is normal, look at the brain. You know, here these ultimate time saving uh, tips. Mohit? Yeah, I, I absolutely attest to everything that is being said. And I don't want to add to similar experiences that I have had. But I want to tell something else. I have had the privilege of traveling with Sir to Japan. We have almost five to seven times traveled together for a common meeting organized by Professor Mizuno. And we used to fly together and fly back. So we had long journeys and a lot of time to gossip. And uh, if anybody knows Dr. Singhal, he's a very measured, even what he eats, drinks, it's all very controlled. And I said that I need to introduce you to a drink. And that was Campari with grapefruit juice. And Sir liked it so much that he asked the audience to get a second drink, which I have never seen him do. So I thought that that was one thing that I could introduce him to was Campari and grapefruit juice. <laughs> Thank you, Mohit. Still... Uh, I like to, you know, you know Sudhir, I'd like to say one thing. You know, Mohit really looked after me extremely well. He really, you know, practically in all the flights to and back, you know, he really gave me a lot of assurance to me and my family. <laughs> And he really, once, you know, at the Singapore airport, he told me that you sit here while I go for shopping and you please don't go till I come back. We go together to the airport. He really was, and of course, I've always admired, you know, him as the his videos are beautiful. And once I think in the update, somebody had not turned up, Eduardo Toulouse, we requested him, he filled in so beautifully. I think uh, his lectures were far better than that uh, of Eduardo Toulouse. I think Jimmy will me out. Thank you. Thank you, Mohit. Thanks so much. Really Thanks for book. everything. Thanks. We still so much I've learned from you. It's, it's only in, yeah. in hindsight that you realize that from whom you learn. Sometimes you think that is part of your knowledge. But when you start getting older and you think from where did I learn that? And then you realize, oh, that was that lecture. That was that little tip. That was that little nudge. That was that little push that makes one a neurologist today. So, and we have been very privileged to have such great teachers in Mumbai. So thank you so much for everything, sir. Nirmal. Nirmal, can you come up? Sir, sir, did you yeah. to respond? Pardon? Hello. Yeah. I'm asking, uh, do you want, did you want to say anything, sir? No, no, I said, no, for Mohit, but you know, how he looked after me. <laughs> too, and otherwise, and I admire his videos, and I think uh, sometimes, you know, it's a great learning. How oh, his videos are so beautiful, you know. Once I requested Anu to show me the technique, once you and Lunaula in your course, I sat with her. Because I think uh, really, I think remarkable. And the Wilson lecture, even Tony Lang got up and really admired and appreciated. And his current uh, opinion now, the talk, this, I mean, the, what they've written is excellent. Worth reading by everyone. Thank sure. you so much, sir. Thanks so much, sir. Nirmal? Yeah. Uh, good, good morning, sir. First of all, uh, Namaskar on uh, Guru Purnima. I had a privilege of, I think, among all of you, working maximum time with Dr. Singhal for four and a half years. And uh, I almost knew from his expression what he want to say. I hardly seen him one or two or three times getting angry. Uh, all the resident may not be able to hear, but from his gesture, from his thing, I could know that today, sir, is in the good mood or so today, sir, is a little bit upset. There are a few things which we must learn from him. The, the discipline. 7.30, he is in the hospital on the 14th floor means 7.30. If it becomes 7.50, that means there's something is wrong. He would call you and tell you that he is stuck up somewhere. 
everything is systematic his uh, tea time or his lunch time is seeing the patient everything was systematic and i have learned a great today whatever neurology i know is only because of him by just observing him we i would stand in front of the room gate when i had a difficulty in case because he would take only one second one minute or 30 second and walk out of the room telling that this is this is out but where we wanted to learn i would stand on the gate and don't let him go out from that room till he tells me that uh, what was it and how it was so that trick we used to you know play with him to learn from him but one thing is when you are taking the histories and uh, while sitting in his room and writing and then listening to him examining him you learn a great deal so those three or four years where you were writing the history i still don't know the mystery of one patient where i i wrote the history and gave it to him and he just examined the extensor of the hand elbow and he said myasthenia gravis i still don't know how he said that that patient turned out to be myasthenia mm-hmm. i really it is now 30 years i still don't know that mystery and he hasn't told me that how he diagnosed myasthenia in that patient but there was no other clue in the history i could get so these are some of the things which he had, and he had never bothered about anything else like you know he wouldn't bother about the clothes he would not bother about the suit he would bother about telling the patient exactly what it is he would get disturbed if a patient is poor and he has been put into a higher class or his money has to be taken and he would see to it that that patient goes into the general class or he goes into the free so these are some of the things you know to be empathy with the patient which we have learned from it we may not have otherwise picked up in a city like mumbai which is you know like only to get the facts so sir you have taught us discipline you not only neurology you taught neurology to everybody but you taught us discipline you taught us empathy with the patient taught us how to manage the patient in difficult circumstances and how to listen to them and handle them when there is a crisis thank you very much sir nirmal i wish many more people have the industry or the capacity to work as hard as you can i think you did a remarkable job as a registrar doing two rounds and you know i think uh, absolutely fantastic you know and even so now we had 50 patients that camps, like and, camps and the thing that you organize i really admire extremely good you know so you. i'll ask uh, kayur to come on next kayur yeah good morning sir uh, i think it's good afternoon now uh, anyway uh, i will like to share two experiences years apart one is when i was his uh, registrar and uh, we had a patient admission around 11:30 at night i went to examine the patient this patient was uh, a patient of bulbar myasthenia and remission and had come with difficulty in speech and was admitted i spent almost 45 minutes examining the patient and realized that the patient had a hemi dysesthesia i mean hemi anesthesia and i thought this was a stroke and we had to do a ct scan there were no mris those days so i was wondering whether i should call dr singhal at the middle of the night to ask whether to go for a scan or not and i told the patient that i think this is a stroke and uh, the patient handed me a note which dr singhal had handed to the patient this patient was getting admitted at 11 o'clock dr singhal was walking out of his clinic at 11 o'clock they had crossed across the door of bombay hospital and dr singhal had given him a note and the note mentioned dear dr surya oblique dr butch the present episode may be a stroke and i said i spent 45 minutes figuring this out and how did you make this diagnosis without examining the patient in one moment the patient had not come for follow up for years together next day morning i asked him and he said that this patient was patient of bulbar myasthenia his symptoms have already always been dysphagia and this time the patient complained of dysarthria and while we were crossing i could see that little facial deviation and that made me the diagnosis i was i mean that was ah. beyond my understanding first lesson and then years down the line i was to migrate to usa i went specially to bombay to meet him and uh, we talked for a while he asked me the reasons for going to the uh, states and he just said that butch knowing you i don't think you will be happy there everybody was saying that ja ha jao jao usa mein bahut maza hai all this and this is what dr singhal said and when i uh, i almost in 9 months i came back in 2006 i returned in january february i came for the neuro update 
And when Dr. Singhal saw me there, he said, are you here on a vacation? I said, no, sir, I'm back for good. And he just gave me that smile, which said that I told you so. I mean, he can read a person in and out. I don't know how he knew that I would be coming back. I, I, these are only two uh, examples of numerous examples where I have learned from him. And I still keep learning. Thank you, sir. Thank the you second is correct. The first one, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that that uh, you remember? I don't know if you remember the case in the wards where the patient was walking. One girl who had been seen in multiple institutes for recurrent drop attacks, and she was on all sorts of anticonvulsants. And we saw the patient. We did all sorts of things, and we were thinking of what unusual epilepsy. And he just saw the gate, and he said, "Look at the atlant direction junction," and she had AAD. And you know that was the cause of a drop. I, I I remember that one. We made a diagnosis of mitochondrial. I was the junior register that. Anyway, Dr. Nita Mehta I think, next. Uh, another important thing, sir, is that the way he encourages his students and colleagues and uh, he supports. Them. And uh, whenever you are in difficulty, you must uh, always remember how Dr. Singhal would face this kind of situation. Oh, I think see, uh, yeah, the encouragement is uh, tremendous. Yeah. Actually, I had no intention of going into like uh, this organization, but no, uh, when I organized the IN in Nagpur 2004, he said, Chandrasekhar, you must go into executive, become secretary, become president of Indian Academy of Neurology. That was doc because of Dr. Singhal's encouragement, I entered into this uh, organizational work and now in the WFN. Thank you very much, sir, and for your all the encouragement all the time. You are the trustee now in the World Federation of Neurology? <laughs> to be nominated? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Congrats. Uh, Dr. Nita Mehta. Mm -hmm. Madam, are you there? <laughs> Hello, this is Dr. Nita yeah. Mehta. Me? Yeah, madam, madam, you need to speak. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Uh, oh, oh, okay. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, I absolutely agree with everyone that what you learn, you only learn everything, all neurology, by just observing him and not even asking him questions because just the way he examines and just one or two sentences tell you, you understand as to what the problem is and how you should go about it. I'll only give one incident. I was the registrar and that was almost my first or second week. I had, patient had come with seizure and I had actually done a long history, examination, everything. And I was feeling very happy that I had made a diagnosis of probably a tumor and I presented everything. After that, he just put the, his hand on the abdomen of the patient, palpated the liver and told me this is metastasis. And that, that was actually hepatic with a metastasis. So I think whatever you learn is from observing. And apart from that, you also learn how to deal with the patient. I remember when we had a very serious patient, nothing could be done. But the relatives insisted that we must call Dr. Singhal. And he came and talked to them, impatiently examined everything, knowing that nothing can be done. But patients were so satisfied. And that's the thing what you learn from him. And Sir, we keep on even now learning from you. Thank you. Uh, there is actually a question, and it's something that's been there in my mind. It's actually a question on the question and answer. This is from somebody who's anonymous. Uh, I'll just read it out. Uh, sir, it was a very inspiring lecture. I am from Maharashtra, and I did PG in pediatrics. I'm pursuing DM neurology from a peripheral hospital in another state. I'm passionate about neurology and working hard. But I have one doubt whether it makes any difference in getting job and in learning further at Mumbai after my DM. I feel I might be lagging behind as compared to DM students from more prestigious colleges. Need your guidance. I think, sir? I think, uh, you know, I think in Bombay, probably the interaction is a bit more. I think probably in Nimhan, Sri Chitra, or India Institute, I think the interaction would be much more. But in the practical management, perhaps uh, spending some time in the public hospitals, you know, like Kokila Ben or also Hinduja Hospital, I think spending some time, six weeks in each, might be useful because many a time in these major institutions, uh, it's much more research oriented. If the person is really research oriented, should really work at Nimhans and Sri Chitra. 
an All India Institute as the PGI. But if they are interested in going into delivering services to the patients and not going into research, then perhaps the other hospitals are useful doing DNB or what it is. That's what I think. I was quite impressed by the pathologist Anita Mahadevan, who was there last evening to you know, listen to the lecture of uh, uh, Sam Sin Patok. She made some comments which are very, very, very good. The technique that she's using was very good. So I feel that uh, a little combination of the two, academic and non-academic is good. And in neurology, perhaps record keeping will help you considerably. I think, uh, you know, I should be trying to find a place to hide myself because I wanted to hear, or next time you have a session, please keep the mistake that I've committed. <laughs> Sir, Sudhir Bhai is next. Okay. Sudhir? Uh, Inspector, sir, first of all, please accept my pranam. Uh, when I was studying MD medicine, I had read about William Osler. And when I came for DM Neurology at Mumbai, while closely observing you, of course, I was with another institution, but you used to come for your well, lecture. Uh, Hello. May I be meeting you? Hello. Hello. Huh. Oh. Yeah, so, while... Uh, uh, Attending your lectures, I had that exact impression what William Osler had written about the great physician. So the character, the compassion, the, the hard work, sincerity, knowledge, ethics, communication power, all these basic qualities I found in. So I thought you were my idol. And basically, uh, I started uh, believing you in you. And you were very instrumental in uh, inspiring me because there was some phase in my life doing DM Neurology where I was in a doldrum. But you had given me a lot of inspiration. I continued and finished my DM. Then I wrote a book on public education. You said that you should translate into English. And you wrote the foreword for that book. So many times we called you at Ahmedabad for you know, difficult patients, and, and diagnostic issues, etc. And you were kind enough to give perfect guidance. Sir, we learned a lot, particularly myself. I have learned a lot from you. How to communicate, how to listen more from the patient. You just listen 70% of the time. It's the patient that talks. 30% of the time only you talk. So that's the... Uh, you know, you're a man of few words, but the wonderful way of communication, your gesture, your your style of narrating things, I think these are wonderful. I mean, I've learned a lot from you. The mm -hmm. way you preserve data, the compassion that you show, the way you help, you know, helping patient getting up from the pot, etc. Small little things I observed. When I passed DM, the next day only you called me up, Sudhir, you have learned academics, now you come and learn profession from me. And I think that was a game changer as far as I'm concerned. So I uh, worked with you for six months at your Bombay hospital. It gave me a complete professional attire. And you never turned down any person, let alone residents, they, they said relative of the patient or patient. So. I, I tried to minutely observe all your qualities, and these have been, you know, very, very fundamental in my practice. I try to, you know, uh, imbibe all these things and try to emulate you, but it's impossible to emulate a person like Dr. Singhal. But even if you do little, ten percent, twenty percent, I think one is successful. So, sir, we owe a lot of things to you. We have highest regards for you. And we wish that you have healthy another 20, 50 years, 25 years, and you guide us, keep on guiding us. Thank you very much, sir. All I am today, I think one of the major component is from you. Thank you, sir. Thanks, uh, Subhir Bhai. Charu, Charu is left, no? Yeah, next, Charu. Yeah. Charu, uh, I mean, we when we were students, I mean, soon after we passed out, we always had this grouse that Charu was Dr. Singhal's favorite student. So, I got a year from him. <laughs> so, He's always um, partial to women, so that's Charu it. And Charu. <laughs> so Charu and Jimmy. I, I just have one thing to say that, you know, if somebody asks me, who's the person who made a difference in your life? One single person. And that is you, sir. You made a difference to my life. If I'm a neurologist, it's because you had encouraged me as a student. 
and if i did well in my life it's because you always were encouraging you you always think your student is always right and you always stand by us and that's the way you thought of me you always thought that i could do no wrong so i'm really really grateful for the confidence that you had in me thank you chau thank you thank you right so very great uh, Oh, <coughs> uh, Jimmy. Uh, yeah, I think everyone has mentioned, and I completely, completely endorse everything that has been said. I think you learn from him on the rounds. He will not ask you to, you know, wrote ten causes of headaches, but you learn from him. You learn that, you know, if there is position sense lost in the fingers, it's the cord. and if the position sense lost in the toes then it's more of peripheral neuropathy rather than a cervical cord you learn all these things you 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 learn the importance of punctuality punch is to the minute and if he is 2 minutes late he will he will apologize to that extent but above all i think if one is fortunate enough to have spent enough time with him i think you learn to be a much better human being i think you know i think we are all better human beings because of you and uh, last of all just uh, you know a thought that you know in case you can make out that he's a bit annoyed or he would this thing then he will sort of gently tell you now come on come on now jimmy come on now means you know something's doc. wrong with doc, the way we doc. are thinking <laughs> no, you propose and doc instead of he's really angry it is doc doc Uh, our dog yeah come on dog <laughs> you should understand that there's something which is grossly yeah. wrong with you yeah. <laughs> right. thank you very very much pankaj are you there you have to unmute yourself pankaj was there yeah he's there i can see him <clears throat> yeah hi <clears throat> yeah hello sir yeah uh, so uh, i mean it has been just wonderful listening to all these anecdotes in every single uh, story um, i mean i uh, i am just speechless about you know really what to say about dr singhal but uh, i have been at the receiving ends of uh, many, uh, many many you know doc sort of remarks <laughs> doc and, moments uh, doc moments where uh, you know he doesn't really like what you have done or uh, you know so there have been several moments like that one incident i thought i would just share so i remember one july when i was with him my mother developed severe backache and uh, i brought her to the hospital i'm sure he may remember and uh, we did all ct scan and everything of her spine and she had just unbearable spine pain and i didn't know what the hell it was and uh, anyway when he walked into the room next morning he just asked if she had any tingling in her in our fingers and i had not even thought of that or even remotely considered anything like that and when she said yes he just walked out and told me it's gbs and so from that day and she of course had quadriparesis and went on the ventilator but walked out a month later so i mean uh, this story i tell to my patients even now that uh, severe spine pain can sometimes be seen in gbs that was just one example of so many so many things that we kept learning from him and i think it's impossible to put in words so i am personally very very grateful to sir for for guiding me i remember one more thing that when i was in a taxi with him we were going to buy a sony laptop which he had decided he would buy and uh, we were at marine drive in a taxi and and he and uh, you know i was feeling a little uncomfortable as one always does when he when he's sitting next to him alone <laughs> uh and uh, you know he thought he had to say something because really getting awkward with 5 minutes so then he asked me what do you want to do after this so i said sir i i don't know he said you should do some sub specialty because i think you are cut out for that so what do you want to do so i immediately said movement disorders because i had developed some interest so then he said i think that is an excellent idea and you will do well so i that thing stayed with me and he has been he has been helpful at so many moments of my career uh, i continue to learn from him i am in awe of him and uh, he is the finest teacher the finest human being forget neurology he has taught me more about life i think 
so uh, next to my father i think he is the only person uh, i really respect and uh, thank you sir for that so i'm going to actually there's just that laptop incident reminded me that uh, when sir bought that desktop computer that he spoke about oh, that was yeah. the largest check i had ever seen till then <laughs> <laughs> anyway so ashish is uh, uh, ashish you are there yes sir yes, yes sir I'm here. yeah come on good afternoon everyone and i think after listening to such a magnum opus and something like bahubali stature life of sir uh, i just want to bow down and pay my obeisances to sir and uh, i have just spoken once with sir and one thing i would like to say that when i was ug in grand medical college i had an opportunity to uh, meet and uh, talk to vadia sir also so seeing sir uh, their colleagues teacher i mean students like kharilkar sir and all of you i feel blessed that uh, those values have trickled down and uh, we are lucky that we are getting to see you all and uh, getting to learn so i'm i feel lucky and blessed and i really want to pay my obeisances to all of you and especially to sir and uh, thank you thank you my pranam to all of you thank you thank you sir ashish has been helping us run this whole initiative uh, and in fact uh, you know, sudhir and i wouldn't really be able to do this without all these guys chipping in and taking over so much of the work from us now i would like to add one more point is that he doesn't only take care of the student but he takes care of the whole family in fact he knows the whole family by name and he would ask what she is doing what you is your daughter or son is doing and he would take care of their problem also so it is not a um, student teacher relationship it is like a father looking after his son that is the uh, teaching which we have got from him oh, i remember when i, can, I was really I, he had come down from bombay and he was such a reassurance at that time yeah. and uh, even now when my mother will call him up he will speak as if you know there uh, absolutely he is a family person he has come for my daughter's wedding and i'm sure everybody has those experiences i, I think he is more friendly uh, to my wife than myself <laughs> <laughs> Yes. I think we've embarrassed uh, sir enough. Uh, very much, very much. <laughs> can, I, can I add one line? That is the truth, you know. There is no embarrassment. <laughs> Whatever it is said, it is. Listen to all this is very, very embarrassing. <laughs> you know, unbelievable, line. also unbelievable. I think naturally, you got to say only good points. No, you can't say the bad points. <laughs> But I wish you had none. How would you say, sir? <laughs> no, you know, I'm quite sure that. I must have rubbed many people in the wrong way. <laughs> I must have done things so. wrong in many ways. I disagree with that. <laughs> no, no, not yes. wrong way, but but I am proud of one thing about his timeliness. He used to come to JJ uh, Bombay Hospital at seven thirty, and it would have to start in the fourteenth floor. It hasn't rubbed off on you, Sudhi. Four five times, I would join him in the tenth floor. I would have excused me. the bathroom was filled. The, this was there. And finally, I made sir change his time and bring it down to the level. Anyway, it didn't last beyond Sudhir, your. Sudhir, I have only one line to add, if you allow. Yes. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. As a token of my appreciation and love for sir, I have created a presentation: ten golden rules of success in neurological practice and i have presented this once in our ien and i i would love to do it repeatedly whatever he has taught we have to you know spread out sure. to the new generation sure sure sudhir bhai thank you <laughs> right sir uh, since i am uh, in a sense de facto master of ceremonies i get the chance to pay the last compliments <laughs> there are there are a couple of one liners that i remember from you one is and i still use them one is of course to my students that uh, this is what you said you said you we teach you by making you teach us do you remember that of course that is very true though yeah. yeah and uh, then there was another i think once you were attending uh, you were an examiner and uh, uh, you came out And you said the students are doing well, but the examiners are not doing very. 
Very true, very true. वॉटेवर आय वेल बिफोर आय ऍक्च्युली गॉट इन टू पॅलिएटिव्ह केअर आय मीन व्हॉट एव्हर टिप्स अँड ट्रिक्स अँड वन लाईनर्स अँड थिंग्स टू से वर ऑल बट देन ऑल ऑफ यू ऑलरेडी सेट दॅट सर हेड आय मीन वी इम्बाइब्ड ऑल ऑफ दॅट Yeah, yeah, there well, I think I'd like to say that I'm very, very proud of all of you. You have really achieved a lot, reached great heights, and that is what uh, gives me great pleasure. This, of course, has been whatever you've said is unbelievable, and I think very embarrassing indeed. And thank you very much for all the showers that you have given me. It was very, very kind of you, very kind of you, and I hope the lecture or the whatever talk i gave was uh, you know i think uh, not too much of a waste of time for you people but that mm-hmm. was the truth you know so i thought i was carrying you along the take home points need to be taken home really yeah thank you sir <laughs> thank you very much sir, sir, thank you sir, for being with us thank you for spending time with us no no it's very kind of you part of our life very kind of you to invite me no but thank you very much indeed know. thank you sudhi very kind of you and thank you roop you know for conducting this and for all of you who have said whatever you have said i'm very very grateful thank you very much thank you so i'll leave Bye. now okay thank Bye. you thank you thank you sir. thank you uh, i'm yes, sorry uh, uh, ashish's uh, quiz has been postponed for the second time uh, so that's not fair waiting for his quiz and now the quest question is when is the quiz going to be what is the answer to that yeah so sudhir i think we'll take this offline and uh, we'll we'll have to discuss it in a coordinate meeting because we need to now uh, schedule these a little more systematically i think yeah two, sudhir two uh, components announce about the okay. saturday yeah, please announce uh, we'll say bye to all the participants uh, thank you everyone.